All right. So it's a pleasure to get to speak before y'all today. Um, I appreciate y'all so much for coming out and being with us this morning. I know it becomes whenever you're, I don't know, something about being in this room, you know, it kind of crams us all together. And for sometimes that makes you a little uncomfortable. Sometimes it's a nice homey feeling. Sometimes it's both. And that's okay. But we're here. And I I just think of the, the verse where it says, two or more are gathered there, I will also be. It doesn't matter if we meet on the range. It doesn't matter if we meet outside. It doesn't matter if we meet in a building with a cross in the front of us. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day, as long as we're meeting together. You know, it's the fellowship of believers that really matters at the end of the day. But it's a pleasure to get to speak f- before you. Um, one thing I've noticed, that no matter how many times I'm given, I'm given the opportunity to preach, I never really quite shake the butterflies that get in my stomach right before it happens. And I don't know if, buddy, you can attest to that, too. It just something about it, even, you know, doing it for some time, not that I've been doing it very long, but it just never goes away. You get used to it, but... It just doesn't really change, and I think that's a a good thing. I think that one thing many of the preachers I know struggle with is uh, coupled with that butterfly feeling is an unworthy feeling that you get. Because at the end of the day, I'm a sinner, I've fallen short, and to be given the opportunity to speak before people God's Word, it's a humbling act. And especially, you know, it's a fearful thing too, because I know that the teachers of God's Word will be held to a higher standard come judgment day and that's a sobering thought um i look around at a room filled with his creation and i see your eyes and i'm reminded that just because there are some of us that are called to preach that that doesn't mean that we're better or more clever than other men truth is i'm a weak man i made a flesh and bone a bad leg and uh, i got a dad bod as they say Amen. Yes, sir. Um, that's a Pickens County classic right there, you know. Uh, but I got a bad leg. I've got a small esophagus. And the truth is, on paper, I'm not that intimidating. And that's okay. But the truth is, the only strength I have to rise in the morning is from God. The only strength I have to live to fight another day comes from Him. It comes from God sustaining my heart and putting away the old man, the old me, the sinful me, and helping grow the new man, the saint I can be. Not of myself. This is not something that Matt Bearden does. This is all of God and all on God. But let it be known that the only reason that I stand and breathe is not of my own strength, but of his. And any and all good that's found in me comes from him from above doesn't come from me he uses weakness to show strength we've heard this often in our lives but it's something so easy to forget so many of us in this room are going through hardships many of us we don't want to speak of them oftentimes when i was a youth pastor i could look around at a room full of teenagers that were struggling and they were obviously struggling just by the looks on their faces and in their eyes but they were seldomly they were seldom to ever speak of what they needed and that's all right But the truth is, is that the Lord knows their need, just as he knows yours as well. So if you're dealing with something today, don't be afraid to cry out to him, even if it's privately, even if it's in your own head. If you don't have the strength to mutter the words, God knows your heart. He knows your thoughts. And he searches those things. I'm thankful that someone does, because otherwise I think there'd be a lot of us that are just stuck in perpetual sadness. See, the truth is, that I rely on his strength, his love. You see, I am, and you've often heard me say this, I am merely a beggar trying to show the other beggars where the food is. That's the best way I can think of how to look at ministry, is that the man that stands before you is not better than you. He's just trying to show you where the food is, where the sustaining grace is, where your true sustenance comes from. It's not from me, it's from God. The food, if you will, is only found in Jesus Christ. It's not found in man, the traditions of man. It's not found in deacons, elders, pastors, or preachers. It's not found in teachers or laymen or even the congregation. It is not found in your husbands, your wives, your boyfriends, girlfriends, mistresses, or friends, nor in your mother and father. The food is not found in your presidents, your kings, your queens, your legislative branch, or the monarchy alike not even in your or my country. 
our food, our salvation, to be more specific and to the point, is found in Jesus Christ alone, nothing else. Nothing else. It is received by placing faith in him. No works could ever save you. This is uh, uh, shown in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Can I have someone read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? You know what? I want to have an interactive day with that. Don't mind the uh, random gunshots you'll hear. <laughs> we are having church at a gun range. Thank you. Yeah, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, please, sir. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yep, and I think every single person should be reminded of that, especially it's so easy to get caught up in doing a works-based religion and thinking that I have to do and do and do because I want to earn salvation, but that is the opposite of the case. God has already done, so I do in response. There's no amount of works that could ever save us. See, God sustains the soul of a man. He sustains his children and all who rest in his hand. He will never let perish. We live in a world where death resides heavily. And we so often, we fear death or fear men or other causes that could bring about death, disease and so on. But God is in control of the soul. We may lose our lives, but those who have faith in him will regain their life in eternity with the Father. Do we truly die or just change locations? I think that's a very poignant question. Do we truly die or do we just change locations? Now, don't get me wrong. One day, you know, if the Lord doesn't come back, we're going to die and our bodies are going to decay, but our soul goes on. But do we truly die? Is it truly the end, if you will, or are we just going on to the next location? Our earthly bodies are temporal, but the spirit in us lives on. Why do you think our Lord said in Matthew 10, 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The Bible mentions two types of fear. The first one is a beneficial and is to uh, be encouraged. It's a beneficial fear. It's a respect. It is a reverential awe of God. It's reverence for his power and, its, and his glory. And it is showing proper respect for his wrath and justice. The other fear is a detriment to the whole human soul and should be overcome by prayer and trusting in the Lord. This type of fear comes from anxiety, depression, the, heart, the heartache of life. There's two types of fear that we're dealing with. One is a reverential awe of God, and the other one is of the world. It's not good. One is a benefit, the other one is a detriment. But I want to ask you something. Have you ever gone through a time where it seemed like someone was always watching for you to make a mistake? Like someone is, is out to get you, to ridicule you, to, to bust your chops. I know I have. Hannah, just kidding. Just kidding. That was my <laughs> no, I have a great work environment. My coworkers are awesome, uh, but we give each other a lot of hard times. Um, but you ever went through a time where you felt like someone was watching just to see you mess up, to see you slip, and to call you out on it? All right? I know I have, and many of us have gone through that on either the receiving or the giving end, unfortunately. Whether it was at school at home in a relationship during sports or on a on a um or dare i say it at church church hurt is a real thing and many of us have gone through it regardless of where and when this may have happened it is never a pleasant experience to always feel less than to always feel like someone's waiting and watching to see you slip up and mess up because truth is if you're like me it doesn't take very long for a mistake to arise. And there's, it seems like there's sometimes in life there's just people that hover over just to see that happen. But today I want to encourage you and let you know that Jesus also had a group of people, several, but he had a group of people that would follow him around and they were looking for mistakes. They were looking for slips. They were looking for actions they could use against him. Probably the most consistent group in the entire of the four Gospels are the Pharisees. 
they're usually used as the as the crown example of what not to be in a religious uh, in a uh, in a um, church setting. It's the Pharisee. In fact, their name is synonymous with bad today. It's not a good thing to be called a Pharisee. But they were a group of religious leaders, many of them complete masters of the Old Testament. They were masters of the law and prophecy. That's often not talked about enough. These weren't just guys that were zealots. These were people that were dedicated to the cause. They were just dedicated in the wrong way. They knew their stuff. If you quoted Torah, they knew Torah. And they knew it better than you and I. But we see that these masters of the Old Testament, just because you know what a book says, doesn't mean you know who inspired it. We're going to get into that today. We're going to look at a very specific interaction that they had with Jesus, and that's going to be our focus today. If you would, please join me in uh, turning to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to start at verse 1. And before we get into this, in Matthew chapter 15, we're going to start at verse 1. I'd like to tell you some context of what's going on in this passage. For context, please understand that Jesus' ministry is in full effect. He is healing people. The disciples just saw him walking on the waters of the sea. He has been rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. And he has been giving many sermons and parables up to this point. He is already given the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably the greatest evangelical sermon ever preached. He's been casting out demons. He even claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath. That is to say that he claimed to be God in the flesh. Needless to say, he was catching some attention of lots of people. This is where we find ourselves when we look at Matthew 15. He's in the midst of his ministry, and it's starting to come to a head. The Pharisees are already starting to plot. We read in the next few chapters that they're starting to plot to find a way to get him killed. This is what the Pharisees were doing. But let's look at Matthew 15, starting at verse 1. We're just going to read verses 1 through 2 first. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. All right. So what we see here is that they're calling out the disciples. They're saying, your disciples do not, they transgress the, the traditions that we have set of the elders. They don't wash their hands when they eat bread. The Pharisees constantly tried to catch Jesus violating the law. The disciples did not follow this tradition of the ceremonial hand washing before they ate. To establish some historical facts to this, so that we better understand, according to the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish high council, the long-held oral teachings of the elders passed down throughout the generations held nearly the same authority as Jewish Old Testament law. That, that's to say that the oral teachings of the Pharisees and scribes held nearly the same weight as actual Old Testament law. Essentially, they were adding to the law little nooks and crannies and points that they thought that was needed and necessary. They were adding more laws to the law, making it harder and harder for people to live. Now, they thought that they were serving the Lord. We will read momentarily. What we will read momentarily is that Jesus found these manufactured interpretations of the law to be unreasonably heavy burdens placed on the people's shoulders. And... Let's look at uh, Matthew 23, all right? Let's look at Matthew 23, 2 through 4, just to back this up. Matthew 23, verses 2 and 4 says this. This is Jesus speaking. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. Does that sound familiar in our time? They tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. 
This makes Matthew eleven twenty eight pop out at me where Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's not just talking about physical and emotional help, which he does offer to his people, his believers, but he's also speaking to the Jewish people. They were under intense scrutiny of the law. Not just the law of, of the Old Testament, but the law of the Pharisees that they were making in their oral teachings. It was a heavy burden on these people. So when he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, he's being serious to the Jewish people. They're going through something. They're under something that's heavy. But this is a spiritual weight. The Pharisees were putting too much of their own twist on something that did not need it and taught their traditions as laws. The Pharisees and scribes believed that ceremonial defilement happened when unclean hands passed contaminated external matter into the body, through the mouth. By neglecting the ceremonial rules before eating, Christ's disciples broke the traditions of the Pharisees. But the actual law that this man-made tradition comes from required a priest to perform the ceremonial <clears throat> Uh, hand washing before service. All right, the Jewish elders had burdened the people with a purifying ritual meant exclusively for priests. Can I get someone to please read Exodus 30, chapter 30, 17 through 21? Exodus 30, 17 through 21. Last new ordinance for who? Aaron and his descendants. <laughs> but they, these Pharisees were putting unnecessary rules on the Jewish people when this ceremonial law was actually meant for a very specific people. It was a priestly duty, if you will. All right? Matthew 15, 3. Let's turn, let's turn there. 15, 3. We're going to continue on. Jesus turns the scales on them. All right? He says... Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Okay, what an interesting thing to say. These religious leaders were guilty of far more severe offenses than failing to wash their hands. The disciples neglecting a tradition of the elders, but the Pharisees had disobeyed a direct commandment of God. Do you see the dichotomy there? They had disobeyed a direct commandment of God. They had created loopholes in the law, ignoring the will of God to benefit themselves at the expense of the elderly and the needy. Does that sound familiar to us today? There's a lot of preachers out there. There's a lot of ministers, a lot of evangelicals that are out there taking advantage of people, extorting from people. We have so many churches that take advantage and they extort money. They extort resources and time by threatening people's salvation, adding works to something that's already done, requiring every nickel and dime a man makes and claiming that doing so, giving so, is the only way to receive blessing. No, I do not envy the preacher that preaches such things on Judgment Day. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand me. I am not against giving of money, time, or resources, but it is so ridiculously abused by some. There's nothing wrong with giving your money, your time, your resources to help the church. But when the preacher, the pastor, takes advantage of his people, his flock, if you will, that is not right. It's sinful. It's extortion. It's not ministry. It's extortion. But it all comes in its proper context. In some context, it, in some fashions, it, it just taking some and using that to help people, which is what the church should be doing, to help folks that are in need. 
that's what we should be raising our resources and time and effort and money for is to do those types of things. But don't get me wrong, I also understand many churches, they have to keep the lights on. I'm not opposed to keeping the lights on. Don't misunderstand me when I say these things. But there is some that take complete advantage of what's being said. Lord knows I am not perfect. But I think it's the job of the preacher to discuss such things, even if they are controversial. Moving on, Jesus exposed these leaders for who they really were. All right, let's move on to Matthew uh, 15, 4 through, uh, 4 through 9. We're going to continue here. So I'm going to start at verse 3. Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Verse 4, for God commanded in saying, Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect. You see, they changed the, the law of God. He's quoting the, the Old Testament law back to them. He says, what does your tradition say? You change what is being said. And he said, you've made the word of God of no effect. That's not something a Pharisee or religious leader wants to be told. That's, that's a scary thing to have the Lord in the flesh tell you that you've made his word of no effect. Now, obviously, they don't see him like that, but I see him like that. That's a scary thought. You've made the word of God of no effect by your tradition. He says, hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So these men, these Pharisees, these religious leaders are teaching the doctrines of man over the doctrines of God. The Pharisees presented an outward purity, but falsely represented their inner selves. That falsely represented their inner selves. They were not religious leaders, but rather they were religious pretenders. Their hands may have been clean, but their hearts were soiled. For this reason, Jesus said, what, come out, <clears throat> what comes out of the mouth defiles a man? Whatever is in our hearts comes out of our mouths through our words and reveals our inner condition, whether clean or defiled. And we'll see Jesus clarify later on as we get through this passage. <clears throat> so we're going to read now in Matthew. We're starting at verse 10, going to verse 20. We're just going to go through it. <clears throat> verse 10, When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Jesus was a master debater. He was a master orator. It was obviously being God, he knows how to do it, but it's just amazing to me to see the things he, he says and teaches. It's unlike any other teaching I've read in any history book or from any historical figure. Verse 15, Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, all sexual immorality, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile him. So, I will say something that, that some of you might find as, as uh, come off as controversial, but I believe it is impeccably true. Pharisaical works based religion and traditions are still alive and kicking today in the church. But please be encouraged. My friend, God has not called us to a life 
that is a lifeless existence of merely following rules. How many have ever heard that objection to Christianity? Oh, I don't want to follow the rule book. Okay. Well, we all follow rules. So that's already falling apart. But that's besides the point. He doesn't call us to a lifeless existence of merely following rules. What if I told you that God wants your heart and not your lip service? What if he wants your heart and not for you just to say that he is Lord, but to believe that he is Lord? He wants your heart. Why do you think Isaiah the prophet of old writes, because, because this people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me? That's Isaiah 29, 13. They draw near him with their mouth. They're saying, they're saying the things that they're supposed to say in church, right? But their hearts are far from me. And I'm, I'm speaking to myself as well. It's, there's been times in my life where I felt like, you know, I, I go through the motions of church. I sing the songs. I, you know, I shake the hands. I greet people. I'm nice to people. But then there's times where my heart, if you were actually examine it, is far from it all. There's times where I was thinking about sinful things while sitting at the pew. There's times where my thoughts weren't in the right place, where my heart wasn't in the right spot, where I wasn't giving him glory or doing the right thing. We need to draw near him with our hearts. Don't you see it more clearly? God is interested in inner purity, not, not outward ceremony. Worship, authentic worship, flows from the heart. All right? In our Lord Jesus' description of the true kingdom worshipers, Jesus said, what, in Matthew 5, 8, he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see who? God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is his description of true kingdom worshipers. Please listen closely. Purity of heart involves single-minded devotion to our relationship with God. An undefiled heart has no hypocrisy, duplicity, or hidden agenda. The pure in heart desire to obey God's word and please Him in all things. You see, they do more than wash their hands and behave pristinely. They possess the innermost purity of the soul. It's more than just saying, I am something. All right, I can say I'm a doctor, but if you're in need of surgery or medication, I am actually of no use. All right, that's where the rubber meets the road in that respect. To be genuinely pure and undefiled in heart, we must first be saved. There are far too many preachers or so-called preachers that preach salvation can be found in any religion, but this is not so. There is only one name given among men by which we can be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. We are not saved because of any righteous things that we do or things that we say. All right. Can I have someone please read Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 6? Not by works or righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Yep, it's not through anything that we do. It's not through anything that we say. It is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross. As you've often heard said, and you should hear it said more, is that when we stand before God on that day, I won't be able to go, Lord, you know me. Go ahead and open up that gate. You know who it is. No. As much as I'd like to say that, no. I'm only let in by one name. It's not anything that Matt Bearden did. It's not by any of the great things that I may or may not have done. It's only by one name, and that being Jesus. Paul goes on to explain in Romans chapter 10, 9 through 10, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart, pay close attention to this, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Do we see the connection here between Matthew? What is Matthew? What are we seeing in Matthew taught? That what comes out of the mouth, what comes from the inside, reveals something of the inner condition? 
If someone has true faith and they're genuinely believing and it comes out of their mouth, it is revealing something that is real within. Do you see it yet? It is not what goes in, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles or saves us insofar as much as what comes out of the mouth reveals the true condition of the heart. It's not what you say that saves you. Don't walk away with that understanding. But it's the genuine faith that is within in our Lord Jesus Christ. That faith is what saves you. But it, what is it revealed by? This isn't saying it's revealed by men. It's just saying it's revealed by what? That if you confess, let's see, go back to Romans. If you, believe, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Someone once made an objection and said, what if I lie? Well, maybe no one can tell if, uh, if I'm genuine or not. Not so. God can. And don't you think lying reveals something about our hearts? And don't get me wrong, I lie. I'm trying not to. <laughs> All right? But it reveals something about us. We're always in constant need of refinement in our Lord. <laughs> when that day comes, I'd like to be known as the, the pure in heart that can see God. Let me round it all out with this. If one, say, was, let's say someone was plotting to assassinate the president and was caught, the civil law of our land would examine the evidence at their disposal, and that person, if proven to be truly conspiring to assassinate, would be severely punished. However, the civil law of this land could never look at that man's thoughts. They never could. The truest evidence, you ever wondered if someone did something, like you've heard all these horrible crime stories, and there's evidence for both ways, and we don't really know. We walk away going, ah, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but we don't know. There's always someone that does. And the truest evidence, if you will, is of the thoughts of man. It comes from only the thing that God can see. There's a lot of things I can keep secret, a lot of things I can't, but one that I can is my thoughts. But our Creator can see them. Some men are unfortunate enough to have to stand before men and be tried and die and be judged by God as well. The good news is that we all get to stand before at least one righteous judge in our existence, at least once, that being God, of course. But let me tell you, a lot of hidden crimes from those that didn't serve time in jail in our will, world will be brought to the light one day. And the same goes for us. A lot of things that we kept hidden will be brought to the light as well. Any works of darkness brought to the light. And this is sobering and scary thought, but it should encourage us to seek God and to rely on him more and more than we do right now. But God in his love, if you are a believer and have faith in Jesus, he will account to you the life of his son lived and let you walk free <clears throat> as his adopted son or daughter in the Lord. See, the point of this passage is to show you that God examines the heart. It isn't just with lip service. It isn't just with the things that we, oh, I've, I've got unwashed hands. Now, should you wash your hands before you eat? Yeah, I think you should. Okay. But that's not the larger point of what's being said. The reason they were having their hands washed wasn't because of some thing of keeping their germs away. Theirs was a ceremonial thing. They probably didn't care if the disciples had germs or not. They just wanted to find something to condemn them on. And if they can condemn his disciples, they can condemn the man who sent them or is sending them. Okay? God examines the heart. What God is concerned about here is not your stomach or your hands, but he's concerned about your heart because that's where defilement arises in the very core of your being. We need to understand this because 
we all admit that we're sinners, or at least we should. Oh, to sin is human, to err is human, to forgive is divine. People have probably heard that before. Nobody's perfect. We say that, but we still have this idea that sin is something on the edge. It's in our peripheral vision. It's peripheral to our existence. Jesus says, no, defilement comes from the very core of your being, not from the stomach, but it comes from the heart. But vice versa, so does your faith. So does your faith in God. The defilement comes from within, and the faith comes from within. All of it from God. The faith, I mean. If you're someone here today, and look, I get it. A lot of people in this room, I know you to be believers, and um, I know you're you're Christians, and um, and and of course I am too. And but if there's anyone here today that's struggling with that faith, that's struggling to to know Jesus and wants to try and understand Him more, to get closer to Him, please don't be afraid to say something. I'm not going to try and make you embarrass yourself in front of people here if you want, you know. But if you wanted to afterwards, you can always talk to any of us. The thing is, that's the thing as believers. We should all be willing to help our fellow man and woman get closer to Christ or at least help them along the way, showing them scriptures. But the truth is, is that defilement comes from within. There's nothing I could ever eat or do that's going to defile the soul. But the things that I say, the things that I do, that expresses what? Something inward. Something that's already there, embedded. But likewise, faith expresses the opposite. It expresses something outwardly that's something that's beautiful, something that's truly good, and it expresses something that is found within. So with that being said, God bless you all. Come to Christ if you haven't already. But that's all I have for you today. I thank you so much for coming and being with us today. In just a moment, we'll close in prayer. And y'all will be good to go. Yes, sir.